member of the EPW committee, one of my top priorities, along with Chairman Carper, is the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Reauthorization Bill. EP we worked painstakingly, and those were a lot of sleepless nights, too, for many of us and our staff in, in particular, to write a bill to meet our transportation needs. And the, and the chairman outlined a lot of what his priorities were, and I'm going to talk a, about some of what the priorities that I had, sharing his priorities as well. I came to the table with several major priorities uh, for that bill, and I'm proud to say that each one of them is in this bill that we're getting ready to consider. I wanted a robust investment in our nation's roads and bridges. Nothing bugs people more, literally, than driving into a pothole when they know they're paying a gas tax, when they know they're trying to do their best uh, to support their state and local to repair their roads. But it is, it is I think, the least, I think, that uh, Americans as they're going to work or going to school or, or going shopping would expect that they could be safe as they're traveling. I came to the table uh, and we, we did a robust uh, $303.5 billion over five years for the federal aid highway programs, which, as the chairman said, is a 35 percent increase over current law. That investment represents historic funding. These are historic levels uh, of funding for our roads and bridges. And, pr and provides the states that long-term certainty that they need to plan and complete a project. I'm sure, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you have projects in your state that have been on the burner, waiting to be done, are partially finished, and they can't get the investment because they can't get the long-term investment that we provided in our bill. So uh, I have specifically made funding for our nation's bridges a priority. West Virginia has so many bridges. It's a small state, but we got a lot of hills and valleys, so we need a lot of, we need a lot of bridges. One recent report said that 21% of West Virginia's bridges are in poor condition. Another report says that 13% of our interstate bridges are in poor condition. So that latter figure of the interstate bridges is the highest one in the nation. So this created, our bill created a new bridge program. We worked hard with our colleagues to make sure that there is a massive infusion, which there is on top of what we had in our bill uh, in, in the appropriations package. The overall package includes $40 billion in dedicated resources for bridges. This is the single largest investment in bridge infrastructure since the construction of the uh, interstate highway system. This is money that will make a difference for West Virginia and the rest of the nation. Second, I wanted to preserve the flexibility for our states and localities to use federal funds to meet their own unique transportation needs. That priority is reflected in the fact that 90 percent of the EPW bill's funding will be provided to our states through the formula. That means the predictability of the formula that every state has uh, relied on over the last several transportation bills. That's important because it lets states use the federal dollars to address their own priorities. As I said, we have different priorities, from congestion in urban areas to economic growth in small towns. And third, I wanted to make sure that par all parts of our nation, not just urban areas, but the rural areas, benefit from transportation grant programs. Rural areas can sometimes struggle when it comes to receiving competitive grants. It's hard to show cost-benefit analysis. It's hard to show how many people are being served. But these, these transportation corridors are so vital. That's why I'm very pleased that the EPW bill creates a new $2 billion rural grant program that will dedicate resources to something very important to me, the Appalachian Development Highway System, or the ADHS, and other critical pro projects across rural America. We also work together to provide additional dedicated funding for the ADHS in the broader legislation. So what does that mean for my home state? That means that this funding will aid the completion of Quarter H, which is the connector to the eastern and central parts of our state with the metro and D.C. area and opening up more opportunities for economic growth and tourism. So if you're coming from the D.C. area, you can just slice right through uh, the center of the state where you can ski, whitewater, see the beauty, beauty of our, our state, or bring your business. How about that? Finally, we can hear from, we, fear, we hear a lot, everybody hears a lot from folks back home that it just takes way too long to develop a project. We sometimes think, sometimes the bureaucracy is our worst enemy when it comes to building our infrastructure. So we prioritize improvements for the project delivery process to help road and bridge process, projects advance from the planning stage 
to the completion stage much more rapidly. I'm excited about the reforms we had in our EPW uh, bill. Particularly, our bill codifies the one federal decision policy, making it easier for project sponsors to work through the federal environmental review process. Not skirting any environmental review, but just expediting it so it can go quicker, which means more development, more considerations, but also more efficiency on how you spend your dollars. The EPW bill makes other common sense reforms like allowing states to be reimbursed for utility relocation necessary for a project while the review process is ongoing, or even establishing deadlines for federal agencies to make decisions. These are a few examples of the 19 sections included in the robust project delivery section of our EPW bill. Additional provisions in the broader legislation will extend the FAST 41 permitting reforms to help us build other types of infrastructure more efficiently. So my key priorities, robust in investment in roads and bridges, flexibility for our uncertainty for our states, resources for rural communities and especially the ADHS, and project delivery improvements are all reflected in the EPW bill and across the broader package we are considering. I'm extremely proud of the work we did on our committee and to produce this, and I think it will make significant benefits to our nation's infrastructure. I'm also going to talk about our Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. The, the chairman went into more detail on it, but you can see it is very far reaching, the largest, most robust investment uh, and investment in new areas around this very crucial, uh, crucial area. We authorized $35 billion for water projects across the country with a focus on upgrading a aging infrastructure. It invests in innovative technologies and provides assistance to, assistance to rural and low-income communities to help them keep their water safe and clean. The, the bill provides that flexibility I have talked about so that both rural and urban areas can best address their needs. The most significant investments are in the clean water, or in the drinking water and clean water state revolving funds, otherwise known as SRFs. Our former governors in the, in the body would know all about the SRFs, how important they are. They maximize the authority for the states to determine how best to address their own challenges uh, with a revolving loan fund to facilitate additional future investments. When this water legislation was voted on by the Senate, 89 senators supported it. Senators recognize that the legislation will help thousands of communities to improve their health, safety, and standard of living. And I'm very pleased that this bill before us again is a part of this package, a part of the larger package, so we can make sure that it gets to the President's desk. I'm glad that the overall package we are considering represents the largest investment in clean drinking water in our nation's history. It also has some niche things in there that are important to me, coming from the, uh, just that we hear at only in our state, like we're wasting water in our state, or we have leaky old uh, pipes that uh, just leak out 50% of the water from the treatment uh, from the treatment facility to the home. What a waste. Think about our friends in the West and how precious water is in certain areas. Uh, how, what a wasteful thing that is. So we, we addressed some of that in, into our bill. There are a number of other provisions in this large package that will be significant wins for West Virginia and the nation. I launched my Capito Connect initiative in 2015 to help expand broadband infrastructure in West Virginia. Many communities that lack adequate broadband service are struggling economically. And I see my fellow senator from Montana, we have talked about this endlessly on the Commerce Committee and how absolutely important it is. Many communities that lack uh, adequate broadband um, service are struggling. It is impossible to complete, to, to complete, to, excuse me, it is impossible to compete for new jobs if a community cannot offer good internet service, I mean, it's just a necessity, causing these areas to fall further and further behind. So today, education, tourism, healthcare, all require high-speed internet service. Broadband is core infrastructure, and this legislation recognizes that. It's a major broadband investment in this that will tremendously help close the digital divide in this country. We will get it to the last house. We will get it to the last business. Additionally, so significant funding is included in this package to improve our nation's airports. Funding for the Corps of Engineers will improve our water resources infrastructure, our locks and dams. We rely a lot of that 
uh, as you're going down the Ohio Canal, the Big Sandy, in through West Virginia. Reauthorization of the AML program will provide billions of dollars to clean up abandoned mine sites. Another new program will provide resources to clean up orphaned oil and gas wells. Both programs will have a positive effect in this country and particularly in my state. The items I have highlighted are major wins for West Virginia and the nation. They're investments in the next generation, ensuring America continues to compete on the global stage. I'd like to thank Senators Portman and Sinema for their leadership on this legislation and the entire bipartisan working group for their hours and hours of long work. I'd especially like to thank, and we're going to be together a lot here in the next several days, my counterpart, uh, Carper Diem, Chairman Carper of the EPW Committee. I'd also like to thank President Biden for his commitment and his willingness to see this bipartisan work product through. I would like to add that I would like to thank the President's staff because I know that they have committed hours and hours to this effort, beginning with me and ending where we are today. The, I hope this isn't the end. I mean, I hope this is the beginning of the of things that we're going to be doing together. I hope this isn't a one and done. I hope this is the beginning of, of all good things. The American people elected us to do this tough work. Tough compromises are, ne are necessary to develop and pass bipartisan bills. And I believe this legislation is a major positive step. I look forward to working with my colleagues as we begin the amendment process so that we can advance this package. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to join with uh, Chairman Carper in thanking our staff members who have worked so hard on the EPW bill. You mentioned I see your staff over there and part of my staff over here. At the, at the risk of picking one of my favorite children off the EPW committee, I'm going to name my entire staff because they all had a hand in this. So I'd like to thank Lauren Baker, Murphy Barrett, Libby Calloway, Georgiana Clemens, who's going to be a mom in about a month, Marley Collier, Travis Cohn, Sarah DeLevin, Will, Will Dixon, Elizabeth Horner, Max Hyman, Tyler Jenkins, Jess Kramer, Jake Kennedy, uh, Matt Lupus, Kayla McMurray, Taylor Meredith, Jacob Mitchell, Kelly Moore, Catherine Smith, and my staff leader, Adam Tomlinson. I will give him an extra check because he's an amazing person. Travis Voyles and Andrew, and Andy Zook for their tireless efforts that have helped advance this committee's infrastructure legislation. On my personal office team, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Joel Brubaker, and JT Jazerski for their leadership. But I also want to thank your staff. We've worked really well. You and I work well together, but our staffs really do, I think, rely on one another, and that's the way it should be. Uh, I would like to especially thank Mary Frances Repco, because she has devoted uh, many hours and times. She and Adam, I don't know how many times they talked on the phone, but it's many, many, many. Uh, Rebecca Higgins, John Kane, Greg Dotson, Laura Gillum, Jordan Baugh, Heather Dan, Mackie McIntosh, Annie D'Amato, Kenneth Martin, and Tyler Hoffman Rairdon for their dedication to this process as well. So with that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. I'm going to ask uh, the, uh, if I could just to insert just a, a one, one quick comment, Mr. Mr. President. Without objection. The, uh, our ranking member, Senator Capito, has, has, has mentioned uh, very graciously the neighbors of uh, all of my staff. I was here this weekend, she was here this weekend, and uh, there are people here working this weekend, not just our staffs on the Environment and Public Works Committee, not just on the Appropriations Committee, just staffs right, right here in this body. Uh, folks uh, throughout the building, throughout the complex, they're here working. Uh, they have children, they have spouses, they have parents, they have other obligations, they were here working. And uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that. The other thing I, I want to say is, is uh, Ranking Member uh, Senator Capito knows I, I go back and forth on the train uh, a lot of days, much like Joe Biden used to do. And uh, I, uh, almost every week somebody says to me on a platform either in Delaware or here in uh, D.C. waiting for the train, why can't, you, uh, why can't you guys work together? Why can't you folks just work together? And I just wish that they could be here to, uh, to be uh, here to participate, to listen, to hear that uh, actually we do work together. And when the ch st st chips are really down, pandemic, terrible situation, 15, 16, 17 months ago especially, we worked together in a almost unanimous way. And uh, we're working together here in something extraordinarily uh, important. The other thing I'd say, and I reminded the president of this just the other day, this is, is not all on the federal government. You know, whether it's climate change, whether it's meeting our infrastructure needs, 
whether it's a pandemic, this is a shared responsibility. And the federal government certainly bears a lot of responsibility. We have a responsibility especially to lead, but there are states involved and as a recovering governor. Uh, the states are involved, counties and cities, nonprofits are involved, and it's all of us uh, working, working, uh, working together. Uh, and uh, I would just, uh, I, I love to, we have, we have a Home Depot just a couple blocks from our house, uh, Senator Capito. And uh, I, uh, when, uh, when, I, when I think of uh, whether it's cities, towns, or counties, uh, or they uh, have responsibilities to me, uh, and I like to say, you can do it, we can help. It's like they say at Home Depot, you can do it, we can help. And uh, there's a lot of good help here. And for the folks around the country who need help, we're, we're going to help. You can do it but we can help, and we will. And I'll just say in, in closing, I see Senator from uh, Montana is here, great member of, the, of this body, great member from, uh, from uh, Montana, and great member of the Appropriate Committee, and a uh, chair as, as well. And I, I just want to say thank you for all the, of your involvement in this effort, all your involvement as part of this uh, G22, uh, some sanity and some common sense, at times when it's really needed, and just uh, tenacity. And uh, he's the fellow who normally stands at this, uh, is this uh, 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 podium is uh, is our uh, leader, uh, Senator Schumer, and our majority leader. And he was he spoke earlier this morning, and uh, I uh, and Senator McConnell uh, spoke from where uh, Senator Capito was speaking. Not everybody expected uh, uh, Senator McConnell, Republican leader, to vote in favor of the motion to proceed to the, to the bill. Uh, he did, and that encouraged and sort of in uh, others, 16, 17, 18 other Republicans to join in voting for the motion to proceed. We don't proceed unless we have 60 votes. And that was just uh, hugely helpful. And to Chuck Schumer, who was just, uh, I, I, I call my chief of staff indefatigable. This guy, is he just doesn't give up. And uh, I, uh, I've known and worked with him for forever and very proud of, of, of his leadership. And, and uh, I know he'll be glad when this is all over and he can maybe go home and get a good night's uh, sleep. But to his family for uh, his willingness to, uh, to share and our kids' willingness to share him with, uh, with all of us, a special thanks. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Montana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I do want to thank Senator Carper and Senator Capito for managing this bill. Very much appreciate what you guys have done up to this point and what you're going to do over the next three or four days. Uh, Mr. President, I rise today for the same reason that several months ago I worked with four other Democrats and five Republicans to try to get something done to address the infrastructure of this country. Why? Because infrastructure is important. Let me take you back 60 years. It is 60 years ago, it was 13 and a half miles to the closest patch of pavement from my farm. Then I was about four or five years old. And I remember riding with my dad in a GM, 1954 GMC 300 truck on that dirt road hauling wheat to town as he weaved around piles of gravel that were in the middle of that road. And I asked my father, why are those piles of gravel there? And he said, they're working to pave this road. And I said, what does that mean, being a four-year-old? And he said, well, remember the stretch of road, the 150 or 200 yards that we drive on to get to the elevator, right before the elevator? And I said, yeah, this road's going to be all like that. And I thought, wow. And it was. It got paved. Got paved for the first eight miles out of town. And that was pretty neat. We were five and a half miles from pavement then, which was a great improvement. And some 10 years later, a little more than 10 years later, that final four miles was graveled, or was, was paved so that we could access that highway. So why is that important? That's important because not only did it reduce our costs on the farm and things like tires and pins and bushings and ball joints, but it made our farm more profitable. Because of investments that my grandfather and my father's generation made, not only did it help them at the time, but it helps me to this day. That was my first introduction to infrastructure. And that is why, several months ago, I realized that after 15 years in this body, and people from both sides of the aisle talking about infrastructure, that it was well past time to get something done on infrastructure. 
because I knew it was economically important, I knew it would create jobs, and I knew it would help sustain communities all across this country. So what's in this legislation? Why is this legislation so important? Well, let me tell you, it's about the economy. It's about creating jobs. It's about making sure that we can compete in this worldwide economy that we live in. How we can maintain our position is the world's premier economy in this world. So how does it do it? Well, it starts by repairing and modernizing our roads and bridges, our airports, our transit systems. That's critically important for an economy. In my particular case, I live a long ways away from our customer base. So when I jump in the truck and I go to town and I use that piece of pavement that was put down 50 years ago, that's important. When I cross that bridge that crosses the Marias River, when I haul grain to Fort Benton or Great Falls, without that bridge, I couldn't access my markets. Without those highways, I cannot access my markets. So it is critically important we keep our aging bridges and roads and airports up to snuff. And then this also makes an incredibly important investment in our aging water systems. Where I come from, they call it dry land agriculture. This year it's a little drier than we want because uh, we're in the middle of a drought. But the truth is, even if you're looking for drinking water or irrigation water or any water, it's hard to come by. And as our Native American friends have told us many, many times, water is life. And so infrastructure to get water to the point where we can utilize it is critically important. This bill is a major in investment in water infrastructure. And I would say one other thing. Whether you live in the West or whether you live in the East, our water systems in this country are wore out because we haven't done what our parents and grandparents have done. We've allowed them to decay without investing in this infrastructure, which is what we're doing today with this package. And then we talk about broadband, which if we can get this bill across the line, I believe it will fix the broadband accessibility issues in this country. We came through the pandemic and we saw how important broadband was for distance learning, for telehealth, for opportunities for businesses to extend their customer base. This is going to expand. This bill will help expand high-speed internet throughout this country, both urban and rural. And I will tell you, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in my home state of Montana when it comes to broadband. And then there's the grid. If we're going to move forward with electric vehicles, and they are coming, then we have to have an electrical grid that will support that, those electrical vehicles, electric vehicles. And without improvements to the, our, our electrical grid, we will be behind the eight ball all the time when it comes to, for example, the electric pickup that Ford is putting out. I will say in my lifetime, I will probably have an electric tractor on the farm because this technology is moving so quickly that it's real. And this, and this package does much more than that. I just wanted to touch on those few things. But it's done without increasing your taxes, which is really important. Because right now, as we see our economy moving forward, we need to keep it going in that direction. Ultimately, as I said before, this bill comes down to the economy. It comes down to creating jobs and putting America to work. And it's about our national security. It allows us to be able to compete with China in a way that we're losing right now. And, you know, I've heard people come to the floor and say, you know, infrastructure is good, but we don't need it. We don't need it right now. Well, all I have to say, if you believe that, take the keys to the car out of your pocket, known as our economy, and give them to China because you're giving this economy away and you're going to make China the leading economic power in this world. Then there's the issue of bipartisanship that's been talked about a lot today already. The truth is, is this bill has made some news because Democrats and Republicans actually work together 
they actually compromised. Nobody got everything they want, but everything, everybody won. And as I've told many media outlets, this shouldn't be news, but in this day and age, it is. Hopefully this will set an example so that we can have much more bipartisan legislation going forward. And in that regard, I want to thank my colleagues for their dedication to this effort over the last several months. The G10, Senator Portman, Cinema, Collins, Warner, Romney, Manchin, Cassidy, Shaheen, Murkowski. All of you folks who sat with me in the same room and we've battled it out. Sometimes the conversation has been fun, sometimes it's not been so much fun. But the truth is, is every one of these folks wanted to get to yes. And in the end, we did get to yes. I want to thank Senator Schumer. I want to thank him for his patience, not something that he's known for. But he has been incredibly patient as this bill has been debated and changed and, and moved forward over, particularly over the last week. Although I will say that he pushed the envelope and made sure we were tending to business even before that, because I think Senator Schumer also wants to see this bill come to fruition. And I also need to thank the administration. The folks that represent President Biden in these negotiations, and I'm going to name names, Louisa Terrell, Brian Dees, Steve Urshetty. These folks were incredible resources, and they were incredibly helpful, and this bill would not have happened without their input. I also want to thank all the staff members, both in the personal offices and the committees from both sides of the aisle, who gave up their weekends and worked late in the night over and over and over again. I've said this before, I'll say it again, the staff does the work, the senators take the credit for it. The fact is, is our staffs really rolled up their sleeves and really performed in a way that every American would be proud. Look. Over the next three or four days, we have the opportunity to prove that the United States Senate can do big things and still function. The process we've been through hasn't, isn't been pretty. I don't think it's supposed to be pretty. But it's been worth the while. I would say the world is watching, both our allies and our adversaries. Our allies want us to succeed. Our adversaries want us to fail. I would say to everybody in this body on both sides of the aisle, and we did get a 67 vote majority to move forward with this bill, but let's show them that America can function again. Let's get this bill passed. Let's get it over to the House. Let's get it to the President's desk for his signature. With that, I yield, Mr. President. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.